Welcome everybody to our uh, disability uh, history lecture series. Uh, unfortunately, we had a lot of uh, apologies uh, uh, by people who let me know that they were sick, sick uh, or had other uh, activities uh, that they needed to attend. So uh, this is why we are uh, a rather small group uh, this evening. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think we have an excellent speaker uh, here today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gabi Anton Rik, uh, who currently uh, is affiliated uh, to the Center uh, of the History uh, of Education uh, here at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences of the KU Leuven uh, as a visiting scholar. Uh, Gabi Anton Rik, uh, I met her for the first time uh, to the occasion of a conference uh, organized by myself uh, and Sebastian Barsch and uh, Eva Söderfeld and Anna Klein uh, in Cologne, uh, where she presented uh, uh, an excellent presentation uh, on almost the same topic, uh, which afterwards uh, was transformed into a wonderful uh, and must-read uh, chapter in our book, The Imperfect uh, Historian. Uh, the chapter is entitled uh, The Rise of Percentage, uh, and she will uh, do uh, a talk that will deal uh, a bit uh, with the same topic today. Uh, so the title, you can read it uh, on a slide uh, of her talk today, is Disability, Injured Workers and uh, the State, the Emergence of Disability Percentages and the Israeli National Insurance, 1948 up to 1957. Um, I just wanted to add that the Disability History Lecture uh, series was founded by myself uh, as well as Professor Patrick de Vlieger uh, from uh, Social Sciences, Anthropology, and Professor uh, Gaat Wills uh, from the Faculty of uh, History. Uh, and the idea is that we want to invite persons who do research at the intersection of those three disciplines, in a way, Anthropology, uh, Education, uh, and History. And I think uh, Gabi Adman uh, fits perfectly well uh, in that uh, intersection. And without further ado, uh, I just will give you the floor uh, for the next 50 minutes up to one hour. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. I really want to personally thank you also for having me here as a visiting scholar and, um, and for let, inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity. Um, a little bit, bit more, a little bit more about me. Um, I just wanted to say that although I also do research, I'm also involved in uh, practical work for equal rights of people with disabilities. I uh, work at the Commission for Equal Rights of People with Disabilities in the Israeli Ministry of Justice, and I'm involved in the implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. So I'll try to show in my talk how the history and the present combines a little bit. So I'm going to present a, a little piece of my uh, research. And now I'm actually in the process of writing this into a book. So if you want to know more, maybe you'll be able to read about it later. So, um, and then in the end, I'll be very happy if we'll have some time for questions and we, we can converse about what I'm saying. I'm going to talk about the disability percentage system and how it constructs disability, and then talk about how it emerged uh, using a historical example from Israel in the 1950s, the early 1950s. So let's start with this system, the disability percentage system. I don't know uh, if you know it, but um, I'll give you an example of how it works in Israel. So this woman is called Vered, and um, she was injured in a terrorist attack on the tour bus in Bogas, Bulgaria, a few years ago. And uh, of course she received a lot of sympathy from the community and support, and the press uh, interviewed her and her family. And she went through a long uh, rehabilitation process and arrived at the National Insurance Institute where she wanted to receive her benefits. And she was very surprised and hurt by the treatment that she got in the, in the, in the National Insti Insurance Institute. And she went and was interviewed to the newspaper about this. And this is what she said. When the physician from the committee that determines permanent disability percentages read my documentation, he disregarded it with disbelief, looking for negative indications in order to see where I didn't deserve disability percentages. I felt that they were looking at me as someone who was telling stories, treating me like a thief. 
It was like I came to get benefits I didn't deserve. Eventually, the committee determined 47% per, uh, permanent disability, 10% for mental condition, and 41% for orthopedic disability. And some of, she says some of the percentages were given separately to each foot, and another 1% for the scars. So the experience that Vered has, a lot of people with disabilities experience this uh, disbelief when coming to the authorities, and it's not something uh, very unique. Um, and the process of getting disability percentages is, is something that people with disabilities go, go through. Almost every person has to go through this process in order to get benefits. And the benefits that a person can get, at least in Israel, are not only just pensions or some money, it's also, uh, it also affects other things like getting a wheelchair, getting a car, there are other, other exams, but you have to pass this first, and then you have the other things. Income tax reductions, employment assistance, um, all kinds of other things. So it's more than a system that the government, so the government uses it to determine eligibility on the one hand, but it's also more than that. People with disabilities sometimes feel that this is the, the system that gives them recognition or identity. Once you get it, you are recognized as really a person with disabilities, and you're really scared to lose it. Um, so how does the system work? We see here the numbers. This is actually a book, a booklet, that uh, lists a whole list of organs <coughs> or diseases, a list of impairments. It, it goes through the whole body and lists different problems. So um, like in this example, we have the lower limb muscles, and then we have, they mentioned four different types of muscles, and then we have three levels. The medium one is 10%. If it's medium, the impairment is medium, 10%. If it's extensive, 20%. If it's severe, 30%. Um, so when Vera went to the committee, she received these numbers for her feet, she got for her scars, she got one number for trauma, and altogether she got her disability percentage. The system has some assumptions about disability. First of all, it <coughs> defines disability as a damage, an abnormal situation, a negative situation, something that we don't want. The, the book itself, this says that the system, it explains that the system evaluates damages or faults, defects, and each damage is worth a certain percentage. It also assumes that there is such a thing as a normal body. The normal body that um, is worth 100%. And then from that you can deduce the different um, impairments. And it's even more than that because once you deduce, then that's what remains. So if Ferret got 47% disability, so she's, she has the remaining 53%. Now if she have another impairment, it will be deduced from the 53%. It will be like 10% from 53%, so it will be 5%, 6%, not the, the whole 10%. It's like a mathematical calculation that uh, Imagine this 100% complete body, normal body, whole uh, idea. So, and the third thing that it also does is um, imagine that impairments can be evaluated and compared. So it, it assumes that if we have an arm injury that's 60%, the book says it's 60%, and the leg is 60%, so the person has the same amount of disability. You can compare the two people. So you can actually imagine this actually imagines the kind of rating between people with disabilities, who is worse, who is better. Like a blind, people that are completely blind are 100% disabled, but people who are completely deaf are only 70% disabled. It actually tells us what's better, what's worse to be. Um, the, another fourth uh, assumption that it has is that we can see the disabilities. The disabilities are visual and visible and can be evaluated. So <coughs> the list is even called tests. So it assumes that uh, evaluating disability is like grading a test. The evaluator just goes and looks at the person and then he can see which uh, uh, injured uh, organism is okay and then he marks it off on the list and then calculates together and gets to the grade. And the, the wording inside the, inside the book it also refers to things that you can see. Uh, external, like p position or deformity of the back, inability to move the finger. Um, in this example, we see the comfortable position, the uncomfortable position. So we also have to think, what is, does it mean the comfortable? But 
this is the idea that something that you can see, something that you can feel in the picture also, we can see this different um, movement uh, abilities. It's very visual. Um, so in this book, actually, things that are less visible, like pain, subjective feelings, and things like that, they, they hardly exist there. That's a whole different talk, but that's also very interesting. Now, in disability studies terms, this, this uh, system reflects the medical model of disability, what the disability studies calls the medical model of disability. It equates impairment with disability. And we think the social aspects don't exist. Anything to do with stigma, with inaccessibility, this, of course, isn't inside this system. So when we look at the, our lives today, we actually have two systems uh, living <coughs> one with another. We have the system of the disability percentages that almost every person with disability needs, the medical model of disability, and we have the social model of disability which we're trying to push in our equal rights uh, movement in the UN Convention. The UN Convention, I hope you all know this um, picture, it talks about disability, it defines disability differently, it Defi defines disability as an interaction between the impairment and the barriers that may hinder a person's full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So disability isn't just the impairment, it's also the interaction between a person and his environment, or her in the picture. So we see the, the woman, she can't climb up the steps, she can't participate because of the environment. So when we're coming to, to try to persuade people that, you know, accessibility is very important, it's very important how you treat people with disabilities, they, they, it's very hard for them to, to relate to this idea, because this idea is completely different than the idea that they know when they, they know the disability percentages. Almost everybody has a person in their family or a friend or them themselves that have gone through the disability percentage system and they know that people are disabled, they, it's in their body. And here we're saying, no, it's in society. So <coughs> while they, once these two systems exist together, it, it's causing some kind of a problem. And the WHO just came up with a book about this, so if anybody's interested about how to, because this problem exists in many countries apparently. So what I'm trying to do is talk about the disability, the disability percentages and where it's coming from. Um, and I'm using a theoretization from uh, the field of STS, science, technology and society. So when we look at the disability percentages, we're talking about a scientific object the scientific object that influences the whole social sphere and creates social order, certain social order. So in terms of Bruno Latour, the disability percentage can be seen as a black box. That black boxes are practices for producing facts. They are processes in which only the input and the output are seen. What happens inside the box is invisible. Nobody knows what is the expertise that's going on inside the box. People just see somebody coming in, somebody coming out with a number. What, um, and the facts created in the, in the black box can multiply, like I told you before, they can be used in different places, in different areas, in different ideas, in different locations. And they're usually not subject to any critique or questions. Nicholas Rose developed this idea, and he describes the way these black boxes allow the work of governance. So you creating the... Creating facts is done in centers of calculation. The centers of calculation work on groups that are called calculable people, and I'll explain. The centers of calculation are locations in which the black box boxes operate. They are the, the legitimate locations of producing facts. From these facts, they can produce other facts, statistics and graphs. This is the government institution, you can say. The centers define certain groups of people as calculable people. These are people that can be represented in terms of numbers, read and understood. Because if people with disabilities can be, have a number, nobody without a disability has a number. This is a specific group of people that have become this uh, calculable people. Um, the center of calculation in turn produces programs and actions to improve the situation of this group and invests in their well-being, and at the same time, it structures itself as benevolent, as working for the good 
of others. So the idea of the rich research using this conceptual framework was to follow these black boxes, to see how they operate, and then to see how they became framed as black boxes. What are the institutions that the, the black box operates in? What are the groups of people that it defines? And we want to ask if other groups, if other options ever existed and they disappeared in the emergence of the black box. And how did the specific historical context influence this process? So I, what I claim is that the black box of the disability percentages emerged in Israel together with the National Insurance Institute and in the, the context of uh, work injuries. Because the, the idea, when I'm, I'm looking at the beginning of the 1950s, the, the system of the disability percentages already existed. But it wasn't used for work injuries. The disability percentages already existed in the world. It was, it's a trip, the, the origin is attributed to Francois Barami, He's a French mathematician living in the 18th century. And he uh, apparently translated Germanic law codes to compensation, of compensation into mathematical tables. So these systems became more popular for compensating war veterans during the interwar period. So it existed for war veterans, but it didn't exist for the civil people. And what I'm checking is how it came into um, being used for the civil population, and first it was for the work injuries. And I want to focus on the legislation process, I'm sorry. Uh, my research is based on documents from the state archives. Um, what I will present now is the process of legisl legislating the national insurance law, mostly based on the documents left by the legal advisor of the Ministry of Labor, a lawyer expert in labor law courts Lebanon. And just a tiny little bit about the context, the historical context, just so that we can all be on the same um, level. Um, and so we're talking about a period of, I, th I think we need to talk about a period of decolonization, a change between the mandate um, government in Palestine to the colonial, gov the colonial government to an independent state, an independent national state. The British mandate was given to Great Britain by the League of Nations in 1921, just after the First World War, when it conquered Palestine from the Ottoman Empire. The area that was called Palestine wasn't called like that in the Ottoman Empire. The picture here shows a beautiful reflection, I think, of, um, of colonialism. We see the British soldiers there looking at the women praying in the, and they are distancing themselves from the women. Um, the existing population in mandatory Palestine were Muslims and Christian Arabs and some Jews. And during the period, a large immigration of Jews, mainly from Europe, arrived in Palestine. Some arrived for ideological reasons, believing that they would build a new nation for Jews, built on manual agricultural labor, social solidarity and socialism. And many others raised after the, arrived after the rise of Nazism in Europe, and of course, especially after the Holocaust. And I think we can see in the picture um, the woman with the umbrella, and she looks more like a European woman. So, I don't know if it's really, but she's like the European woman standing there with the more traditional woman. And this is the kind of mixture of populations that was in mandatory Palestine. Uh, in 1947, the United Nations declared Palestine would be divided between the Jews and the Arabs. <coughs> and uh, the British left the region, and then the state of Israel was established and started. Uh, there was a year-long bloodshed war. And in the end, the area was divided between Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. And the state of Israel was, so we're talking about decolonization. So we're talking about this, a new state which had a government that existed before it. So it kept some of the existing laws and administration from the, the existing um, the mandate period. But it started to think about new ideas and how to make new laws and policies according to its new priorities and in, as an independent state. And also the new government worked in reference to existing organizations. If there were already existing organizations, especially the labor union was very strong and it had all kinds of institutions for medical, for welfare. 
and the government actually is trying to organize, find its place in this, um, in this system. So um, it's often called statism, um, the process of moving uh, different aspects into the realm of the state from uh, other organizations. And this was sometimes in very implicit. They said that they want to do it, like with the education, all the education moved to be the state. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's very implicit. So uh, now we come to the issue of the national insurance. The national insurance uh, between 1949 and 1950, so the state was um, established in 1948. In 1949, they started thinking about national insurance. Um, and the process continued until 1953. The idea that the state should have a social insurance program wasn't unique to Israel at the time. At the same time, in the 1940s and the 1930s, uh, social insurance uh, was created in different places, in the United States, in the United Kingdom. I know, I think, if I saw correctly, that also in Belgium in 1944, um, that's what I saw, there was, a, there was a social pact that, that organized the national office for social security. So it's also uh, some kind of system like this. And um, although the planners of this uh, legislation thought they would make a really large plan which includes uh, health and hospitalization and dental services and everything and unemployment, in the end they were left with four items only. For every, everyone was for a different reason. One was motherhood, the payment of maternity leave, hospital fees, the second was death, so that's how it was called then, payment for burial expenses and things like that, the old age pensions, and the, and the work injury insurance. So they were just, for the beginning, they were actually just three, the work injury insurance was pushed in at the last minute. But the work in, injury insurance was a program that um, it didn't go um, smoothly. There, there were, at the time, insurance uh, companies that covered for this issue. And they uh, came up, they complained that this, this plan is completely not necessary. The intention to nationalize the workman's compensation insurance branch in the initial phases of social insurance cannot be justified. The state should add types of insurance which do not already exist without damaging the coverage that already exists. They said we're already doing our job. Don't nationalize it. Don't take it from us and put it in the state. So I want to focus on the debate between the insurance company's perspective and the legislators and see how they tried, how they had actually a different, completely different understanding of the whole situation <coughs> and the people that they are giving services, the injured workers, and why they actually couldn't understand each other. So I'll explain how the system that was, uh, the, the existing system worked. This is, um, it was called the Workmen's Compensation Ordinance. And uh, I'll give an example. Um, you see this picture, this is the, the, the example is Mr. Abraham Mintz. He was a 48 year old and he worked at Sadan Machine and Molding Company in Tel Aviv. Sadan is the Hebrew word, word for anvil, the place where you bang the hot iron, you, you see in the picture, into shape. And uh, there's a saying between the hammer and the anvil. So that was the name of the factory, the Sadan. And the Sadan Molding Factory Company was definitely a hard place to work at. So means spent his day standing behind a molding oven working with extremely hot melted iron. He earned a weekly payment of only a little bit above average for manual labor. And in April 1948, he was injured due to spillage of melted iron from within the oven and was severely burnt, and severely burnt his eye. So according to the Workmen's Compensation Ordinance, which was legislated by the British Mandate government in 1927 and updated in 1947, just towards the end of the Mandate period, Mr. Mintz was entitled to receive compensation from his employer regarding the injury. And how was this 
compensation calculated. The compensation was given according to incapacity. Incapacity is defined by the difference between the amount of the average weekly earnings of the workman before the accident and the average weekly amount which he is earning or is able to earn in some suitable employment or business after the accident. So what they're calculating here is the difference between the salaries. Incapacity is the difference, so the foreseen difference between his salary before the accident and after the accident. In order to determine this incapacity, the employer and the insurance company would have to start a negotiation, weighing different aspects of this case. It was, they had to reach a specific personal agreement, and it took into account many aspects of the person's situation. One aspect was a medical evaluation. Mintz was examined by an eye specialist, and he found that his left cornea was covered with stains and blood vessels due to severe burning by hot iron. The physician concluded that the vision in his, this eye was very limited and that it was unlikely to ever improve substantially. Finally, he assessed that his incapacity to work was 20% because he lost his ability to see in his left eye by 90%. And also he added the person cannot work in hard labor such as molding and building because of the danger to the other eye. So notice that the physician is using percentages. He, is calculating his disability, but the meaning is supposedly different what he can work or he can't work. But the medical evaluation wasn't the only thing that was happening. There were other evaluations. Another document stated that the, because the person was already hard of hearing when he, the accident occurred, the accident lay a heavy burden on his working capacity. He is unable to put back he can work in any unprofessional job and he has returned to his work in an ordinary wage with his previous employer. In addition, another, some other personal details were raised. It was it said in the document that the injured person owns a small lot in Tel Aviv and also his brother owns some shops and he's willing to rent him a shop in order to open a grocery store. So maybe Mintz's wife will be able to work in the store and when Mintz has to leave his job, he will join her and they will have some financial um, income. So the, as a summary of all these factors, an agreement was finally reached and Mintz received a lump sum, a one-time compensation of 660 lira, which is about 80 weeks of salary. The agreement was submitted to the Ministry of Labor to for approval. So we see that this system has a few attributes. One is um, that we are evaluating incapacity and loss of wages, that we look at the work injury as a complex situation, we look at all the aspects of a person's life. The medical evaluation is only one of the factors of being assessed. Every agreement is personal to each person. The employer is the one responsible for giving the, the compensation. And the employer can um, take out the insurance policy with the insurance company if he wants to cover the liability. The government doesn't decide what the compensation was, but at this stage, they already examine and approve, approve the agreement. They already have a role in this whole process. We have lawyers that also took part here. The, um, the injured person could take a lawyer. The, the employer could take a lawyer, and there were also committees. The committees were run by the labor union, and if a person was affiliated with the labor union, he could meet a committee that decided what was his uh, compensation, what was his incapacity. But of course, there were also uh, negative things about the system, and there was a lot of criticism about it. <coughs> so one of the criticism was that the insurance company specifically um, were financially driven, they were just wanted to make money, they were commercial, and they were motivated by profits, and also it was wasteful because some of the compensation went to the company and some of only some of the compensation went to the people. Um, so, and also um, some industries complained that the premiums were too high because they were maybe they were defined as risky industries and they complained about that. Also, uh, 
people that work, the lawyers that were working in the system complained about the endless negotiation and that not all workers could receive this compensation and that compensation wasn't secured, that if the employer went bankrupt or um, didn't insure himself, couldn't cover it, then the person didn't get any compensation. And the national insurance law, the work injury insurance, was presented as an answer to all these issues. The premiums would be paid to the government administration and it would allocate entitlements to the population. It would reduce premiums, especially for risky industries, and allow providing slightly higher compensation and secure payments for all workers, including workers for those workers that the employers didn't take insurance policies and couldn't afford to pay. The insurance companies completely didn't accept all this criticism. And they wrote a very elaborate <laughs> letter and they responded to each of these criticisms. And they brought data and they explained why. First of all, they said not most of the cases ended without litigation. They said from uh, 1950, it took care of 16,000 cases and only several tens got to court. So most of the cases, thousands of cases, went uh, without litigation. They also said that be their financial uh, interest was an advantage and not a disadvantage because they wanted to give good service to the employers. They had other insurances that they sold to the same um, employer. They, and giving them a good service here in the injury was their, their financial interest. Um, and also they claim that the other problems, the problems of not all the workers and the compensation, um, could, could be solved by changing the existing law. If the existing law would say that every employer has to insure for their workers, it's compulsory insurance, so they would have to, they, then it would cover all the people. And most of all, the insurance companies said that the negotiated aspects were an advantage allowing them to take care of the injured workers on a post personal, flexible, and considerate way, taking into account the complexity of the situation. So what they said is, um, we don't deal with property loss, we deal with live people who have been injured, with their families, and we need to do it in an individual way, in a humane way, and um, based on a personal approach, psychological understanding, flexibility, and goodwill. They said, in most cases, there is no objective possibility to determine the degree of incapacity to work. Therefore, the insurance companies invite the injured person over, understand his disposition, consider his family situation, weigh possibilities for mental rehabilitation by providing the injured to be arranged in the livelihood that he likes. In this way, hundreds and thousands of injured have been rehabilitated, both materially and mentally. So they said there's such an advantage to this Personal, um, personal system that the, they said the government has to explain why do they want to implement a national insurance. There's no evidence that the nationalized insurance would be better than the existing one. The nationalized insurance cancels the possibility of material and mental rehabilitation of the injured person and turns him into a social case, living off a monthly pension for the rest of his life. So. That was the insurance company's claims. But when they met with the, with the parliament, with the people legislating the national insurance law, these, all these claims were completely not understood by the people that were legislating the law. They, they couldn't refer to them completely. So these are the people. What, um, what happens when uh, a law is legislated? At the beginning, it goes through the, to the government. The government then submits it to the parliament, this, in this case. And then in the parliament, first it goes to the assembly, it gets voted, and then it goes to the subcommittee. The subcommittee is made of a few uh, legislators, and they discuss the wordings and the exact specific um, items of the law, and then, they, um, and, then, and then it goes back to the assembly, and it's voted on, and then they cancel. So it's a whole process. And um, this is the subcommittee, or this is part, most of the subcommittees that discuss the national insurance law. Um, the guy on the, on the right, 
is the Reuben Sherry. He was the chairman. He's from a party, the leading um, political party, the left-wing political party, um, affiliated with the labor movement. Next to him is Hanel Andan, she's from Apam, she's it's also a left-wing socialist party. And um, Esther Vilinsky from Maki, which was a communist party. And these two women were involved in many issues of um, women, labor issues, women labor issues. And there were two uh, other people from the right-wing parties, Benjamin, Benjamin Avniel, he was a social expert. And Ben Sion Arel, he was a doctor, and he came from the Tzionim Klalim, which was a party that had, in this government, 20 places out of 120, so quite a lot. And he, they represented the, um, the business, um, the middle class. And they were quite vocal. And you would expect that these two would be on the side of the insurance companies, not to nationalize business. But now what I want to talk about is how they also became convinced that the national insurance is the best thing. And uh, together with them, we had another two pe and, uh, three people, who, which were government officials. So Giova Lotan, he was uh, the head of the social insurance department in the Ministry of Labor, and he would become the, um, the head of the National Insurance Institute when it was uh, founded in 1954. And Tzvi Barniv, he was the legal consultant of the Ministry of Labor. And there was another person from the Ministry of Justice, which was the one that was wording the law. So as I said, it seems when, although they heard, the, all these people heard the objections of the insurance companies, and they received the letters, and some of them were in the right wing, it seems that the committee only saw the disadvantages of the existing system, all the disadvantages I talked about before, and they saw many new advantages in the new system. So some of the advantages um, were the solution of the things that I talked about before, but some of the things were new things. The law covered all groups of workers that were not previously included in the legislation, like people traveling to or from work, or people injured while trying to save lives or property in the area of the workplace. So if somebody was, uh, there was a fire next door, and he worked in a specific building, he could go to the next door and help with the fire, and was still called, if he was injured, it would still be called a uh, workplace injury, work injury he would be compensated for that. It, um, it's a situation that um, reflects the social value of solidarity, mutual help, collectivist ideas. These things were very um, reflective of the period. So, uh, another thing was that it would cover uh, people in professional training, emergency ambulance workers, people working according to the emergency recruiting regulations and prisoners. These are people that their employer isn't exactly clear who it is, but if they get injured, they will be covered by the national insurance. So the legislation allowed the government to cover groups according to their priorities, especially public sector enterprises. Another advantage was that it would cover all the civil servants, all the government employees, and this was a problem that Sri himself was dealing with, trying to see how, according to the workman's compensation, the government employees could be covered. It wasn't so simple, and the law gave him a solution. And another thing was a financial advice, advantage. The Ministry of Finance backed the law because it was, uh, it was the calculations showed that they would collect more money than it would spend, that it would be a, a, a very um, not risky um, system. So it was backed by the Ministry of, um, of Finance. And another thing that it wasn't explicitly mentioned, but I think the legislators always want to do something new, to produce something new to something else and something better, something more that shows the benefit of the people. And the last, the, something very important is a new idea of what the people that are insured here need, what the injured workers, what we call injured workers, what do they need? And what they needed, according to this law, is things that only the government can provide. So first of all, cure, 
to hospitalization, medical, medication, also pretty and therapeutic equipment, these things were foreseen as something that only a big entity, a government can provide. The other thing is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation um, is something that emerged at the same time, a new area. We have, there are two types of rehabilitation. There's rehabilitation, uh, work rehabilitation, and medical rehabilitation. And these two, it was visioned that these two things have to work together, be a, a new professional field, multidisciplinary treatment, and only the state could provide this in a central location. So it was a, a new field that only, it was seen at the time as something that only the state can give. And the last thing was pensions. The, and when we, they talk about the pensions, then we can see that they're not talking anymore about the injured worker, they're talking about the disabled person. So up to 26 weeks, a person is defined as injured and receives an injury allowance. It's 75% of the salary. But beyond 26 weeks, the person, if it doesn't go back to work, can be considered as disabled. There's, so there's a time period in which the person is still injured and if it continues more than that, the person has to be defined as disabled. And the definition of disabled in the law is a person whose physical or mental ability has been damaged and as a result is unable to perform work that a person of the same age and sex is able to perform. So. While the workman's compensation ordinance referred to incapacity, the national insurance law classified the injured workers as unable to work and later cured or as work disabled. The payment is no longer defined as an allowance, it would become a pension. And this is the same term as used for the old age pension. And the entity that can treat this person is the state. And also it's, it comes into this text another imagined person, a person of the same age and sex that can perform any job, while the disabled person cannot, cannot do this job. And how do we evaluate this person, this disability? Of course, <laughs> with the disability percentages. Um, Zvi Barniv, he presented this. He said, look, there are subjective tests, there are objective tests, there are different variants, but I recommend this. This is the objective test. If I calculate the disability of a person who lost an arm, I do it through the medical tables. This, is, this has much literature that determines that if a person lost an arm and is a male, loses a certain percentage of work capacity. And if the person is a woman, loses a different percentage of work capacity, taking into consideration also the age. So. There's, here there's the issue of gender and age, but this was dropped afterwards and doesn't appear in the disability percentages system, so I didn't talk about it before. But the idea that we can take the arm and give it a number, take the leg and give it a number, is here. And that the disability percentages is evaluated by physicians using medical tables, assuming that the bodies are comparable and measurable. A person has to come to the national insurance to be assessed by experts and the person's opinion and social conditions wouldn't be part of this consideration. So I'm coming to the end of my talk. So the national insurance law sets out a completely different frame than the, existing, than the one that existed in the workman's compensation ordinance. It shifted the responsibility from the employer or the insurance companies to the government administration, the National Institute, National Insurance Institute, this is from today. It compensated for the damage or the deformity instead of the salary. And it determined the compensation according to calculation of disability percentages instead of negotiation. The expertise needed to perform these actions also shifted from a multiplicity of actors, including lawyers, medical officials, insurance agents, the employer and the worker himself, to medical experts who use medical tables. And of course, the group of people being addressed by the legislation were no longer the same. They were no longer NGP workers, they were now a new category of work disabled people. Discussing national insurance also stabilized a new expectation regarding the relationship between citizens and the state, as well as a new role for the government. 
that of taking care of individuals which were categorized as weak and in need of assistance. Work injury insurance formulated as a means of assisting and rehabilitating the new category of disabled people provided the government with a new and unique role of, so of a social platform, a role that they believed the private sector could not take. Barnier even said that one phase that chooses this method of the law essentially contradicts private insurance. So when the insurance companies came back to the Knesset members and they said they could take upon themselves this law as it is defined in the law and they could meet it, they, or they could do it in parallel, the government will do one and they will do the other and they will compete with each other. The whole idea, it was as if the two sides were talking in two different languages. The discussions, there were discussions, debates, letters and meetings, it was all futile. And finally the law was passed and the National Insurance for Work Injuries came into being, together with a system of disability percentages for evaluating this issue. And everything that came before that is completely forgotten. Thank you.